welcome to Women Business Owners Alliance, Learn from the Experts. We call it WBOA. I'm Freda Brown, um, and I'm here today with um, our guest speaker. Megan Murphy. And Megan, uh, what is it that you do? I'm a television producer. I've been working as a television producer for 25 years, and basically that means someone who works in production, whether it's broadcast or filmmaking, um, in commercials or industrials. And most recently I, I worked at the PBS station in Springfield, Massachusetts, WGBY, but prior to that I worked at many TV stations in Boston and production companies as a producer and have done a lot of different things. So there are lots of, lots of people that play with video these days. What was, what was it that made you want to be this, do that job? Well, I always liked photography and I liked the challenge of framing up an image so that when you got it back from the pharmacy, you know, <laughs> um, that the image had a certain aesthetic. I, I'm an artist, so photography was the way I expressed my artistry. And video just helped me move that, advance that, you know, progress to the, another level. I love um, videotaping nature and people, um, just being people. I, I think that there's a beauty that you can get at. Um, and so that, of course, parlayed into practical uses of video, which is interviewing people or telling bits of information for a commercial or an infomercial. But um, how I got started was I, I thought I was going to go into advertising or some communications artistic type of industry. And I was doing a journalism class when I was in school. And the teacher said, I've, I've signed everyone out a camera. And you're to go onto the streets of Boston and do a man on the street interview. And so back then, this is 1982 or something like that. No, 1988, 1987, something like that. So I, wait a second, when was that? That was like 1996. <laughs> Time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I go to the media department at Northeastern University. This is where I was in Boston, heart of Boston. And I, I get the cameras enormous and it's this giant things on my back. And I sort of sort of stagger out to the street and I'm carrying this sort of porta pack with this giant three quarter inch tape. And there's cables like like following me as I walk and I sort of go out to the coffee truck. <laughs> <laughs> There's this coffee truck guy, and I used to see him often. I'd buy coffee from him, and I asked him if I could do an interview with him, a quick interview. And, you know, you, the camera was so big, there's this big viewfinder, it's called, and you look through this thing, and everything's black and white and sort of an alternative reality, and then you're sort of looking and then seeing them human to human. And so I'm trying to go back and forth between these two sort of ways of being with this man. And, um, but I asked him a question about himself and he was trying to, he was struggling too with me, whether how to look at me. And suddenly <laughs> he just started to look right through the viewfinder and so did I. And there was this magic that happened. He, it, would no, it was no longer about talking to me. He was talking to himself. He was talking to the idea of what I might be or who I might be, it was something deeper, something broader. And I realized that there was a powerful way to interact with people that could be experienced through a camera, a big camera. And I became fascinated by the camera as a tool to talk to people, to learn from people, to delve into their inner worlds. And I started using the camera a lot. And I originally thought that I would be a camera operator and I would like be shooting video all over the world. I always wanted to be an international camera operator. But I think what eventually emerged for me is I'm more of a producer than I am a technician. So I can, I'm very curious and I have a lot of questions. I always have a lot of questions. So that parlayed into a career as a producer. Terrific. Wow. So how could... Uh, so what makes a video memorable? How, uh, what if somebody out there wants to make a video, they have an idea and they want to do it, what makes it memorable? What, what are the key components that you have to look for? Well, in many respects, it's not rocket science. 
the tools are much like a novelist's tools. You have to set a, a, establish a location. So I think videos, good videos, start with a wide shot of a place. You don't sort of go right into an extreme close-up shot of a person sort of saying who they are. You want to get um, a shot of maybe the location where something's happening or um, an environment where where you're speaking. Even if it's just a sort of even just us, um, it sort of it starts with a wide shot and then it starts to move into a close-up between you and I. It just is a kind of a... Um, Human beings like to be spoken to in, in a narrative structure, you know, beginning, middle, and end. It's what makes sense to people. So you, you use the, that kind of knowledge to produce well-paced video. So location is important. Um, lighting, people don't realize how important lighting is. Um, tungsten, soft sunlight, you know, the warm temperature lights, I think, make people look better. And uh, it's important to not have, you know, fluorescent green lights when you, you know, do your interviews. Make sure you consider the lighting. Um, backlight kind of creates a little bit more dimensionality if you're lighting, if you're interviewing someone. So that's something else to consider. One thing that people often overlook is the importance of the quality of sound. People think, oh, my camera on my phone is fine. Well, if you really want to do a serious interview, you want to buy yourself uh, a lavalier microphone and, and take advantage of the crisp depth of sound and really the, a, a person's tone will add so much richness to an interview. So those are just a couple of tips. Those are great. Um, so if someone has an idea, what is the first thing they need um, to accomplish? How, what steps? What steps? So you kind of gave me some steps that they need those. But, yeah. But those are steps I gave you were technical steps. I think the key thing is to know who your audience is. Who are you trying to speak to? Older people? Um, a certain ethnic group? People who only shop on Saturdays? I mean, you have to think about who it is that your audience is. That's a really important that consideration. Is. That is. And then the key thing in terms of getting really good content, I'll give you, I'll give you a tip that is, was hard learned from me, but it's, um, I think it's, it's a really important thing, but I think you always wanna, when you ask people questions, you're not always in the shot. You don't, it's more efficient to have the people that you're speaking to put your question in their answers. So if I ask you, when did you first um, begin your, your specialized accounting services? You wouldn't be like, well, it was 1978. You would say, this is what I'm advising that you would have them say, I first began my accounting services specialty in 1978 when I got out of college. So you put the, the interviewer's question into the answer. It creates um, a more of a structured answer that can be used anywhere in uh, an interview. If you're going to ultimately edit it, then you have this standalone thing that's not sort of enslaved to a certain time in the interview, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, certainly. That makes a lot of sense. So um, if in my, fi my final product might not have the interviewer in it. It might just be the person's talking that's right. so that they have to have those answers to those questions. Right. Um, and you can't just sort of have, we started last week, you know, and no one knows you need a context. <laughs> <laughs> when was last week? <laughs> yeah, so we, we first began this project in, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nuts and bolts rule in interviewing, and I, I think it's worth everyone putting that into their toolbox when they do, when they're trying to obtain information from the public or their loved ones. That's great. So you have done a personal um, program, is that not correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's um, I guess you could say it's a personal, a personal passion. I had an idea and I decided to um, sort of go for it, roll the dice as, it's, as it were. But I've been in the business 25 years. I've produced a lot of different programs from cooking shows to teen studio-based shows. I've been in the field all over the place with crews, interviewing people. And I've done a lot of traveling and have shot a lot of footage, you know, in Egypt and, you know, um, India. So at this point, I'm kind of like, what's, what's, what means something to me that I can share? 
And so I happened to be in Egypt and I got this idea that women's bodies carry a particular wisdom, and namely their breasts. And it was kind of this high concept idea. And at first I was like, this is crazy. But when I decided to go ahead and interview women and find out if there was in fact a kind of a breast-based wisdom, I stumbled into a vein of stories that women had never had an outlet for. And I realized I had, had come into something very special and unique. Um, I, so I, I, I decided to resign from my position after 12 years um, and things were going along pretty well there. But I was like, no, this is what I want to do. Women's stories, you know, women's stories that have never had an outlet. Because I knew for me, I had a lot of stories that had, I'd never really had a, a way of sharing them and I'd forgotten about them. But I, I stumbled into this, like I said, this sort of treasure trove. And so the name of the film is called The Breast Archives. Um, the women gave me such rich content that I thought I can make a film out of this content. It took a long time, even with all of my experience, to put together what we call a narrative arc, a sequence of information so that it's, like I said before, the beginning, middle, and end has to be, especially in a project like this, it has to have a certain oomph every so often that keeps a viewer engaged because they were mostly talking heads because it was mostly interviews. I mean, obviously I can't be cutting cutting to shots of breasts all the <laughs> you know, It just was had its own unique set of challenges. So it was about what's first, what's second, what's third, and there's 10 chapters, and you have to be entertaining. You have to keep people engaged, and so you edit that way. You have to use, if someone lifts their eyebrow, you need to take advantage of that with the way you edit. Um, changing focal length mid-sentence mid sometimes will keep um, a segment or a sequence of information, feel, f it helps it to stay brightly paced and, it, uh, and, and dynamic and exciting. So it's, it took me a long time to organize that very personal information from these women um, whose breasts are exposed in part of their interviews, by the way. So of course I felt hugely responsible to do it right and to make sure it was dignified and, and even wholesome, you know. I oh. felt that it needed to be somehow wholesome so it took a while to figure out that. So post-production is what we <laughs> call it in this business. Production was easy. Pre-production was fairly easy. Production was easy peasy. And then post-production has been just this arduous kind of uphill journey. But I'm really happy to say that it's, it's completed. And a lot of filmmakers can't say that. A lot of people start projects and they're not able to finish them because they're just too challenging for so many reasons, plus the costs. I mean, the cost of doing a project like this, I never saw that coming, God, God knows. So, but it is done and um, congratulations. it's, thank you so much. And I'm so excited to share it with the WBOA community. Thank you. Uh, one more question on, on somebody doing their own, because um, a lot of people do videos and they put them on YouTube. What is the, the right time, you know, how, how do you decide what is long enough or short enough uh, that's going to keep someone's attention? Well, like now that I've finished with the film, I'm starting to do sort of one minute pieces for women's websites. And I've done a couple of them. And it's funny how fast a minute goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, gosh, you're barely out of your intro and boom, a minute's up. So, you know, it's reasonable to sort of use a, a three minute time frame and try to have it be shorter than that. The key thing is scripting. You have to write your write your script out. What you want to say. What are your what are your offerings? And you want to have a close, some kind of hook, something, a tagline, so that I'll grab me in to go. So further. at the end, and then you fade to you know your um, your um, contact information. So that's a, a a nice narrative arc right there. So I don't know if that makes sense, but you sort of have your intro, you um, sort of try to surprise them with some interesting bit of information about you so that you stand out. Um, you perhaps list your offerings um, and then you hook them with something unique and special and then you go and then you go to your brand. And I think that's a good time to fade out <laughs> to WBOA. If you want more information uh, about Megan, 
or WBOA, you can go to our WBOA WBOA.org website and you can find out all you need to know. Thank you.